Toward the end of the 1960s, America finally had something to celebrate. Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins had returned safely from the moon. For America, the decade had started with an uncomfortable realisation. Cold War adversary, the Soviet Union, had a commanding lead in space technology. The United States had been seized by a wave of anti-communist paranoia. Nine years and $17 billion later, Apollo 11 had planted the US flag on the surface of the moon. First step foot upon the moon. July 1969, E.T. It came in peace for all mankind. Around the planet, 600 million people had watched on TV. The world's population was watching history, and they knew it. Uh, Tranquility Base, this is Houston. Can we get both of you on the camera for a minute, please? At beaches and rivers in central Florida, one million Americans had turned out to see the launch of Apollo 11. November the 14th, 1969, was a wet day at the Kennedy Launch Center. Numbers that turned out to watch the launch of Apollo 12 had dropped by two-thirds. After the huge viewing numbers attracted by Apollo 11, NASA upgraded all aspects of the television coverage for the remaining moon landings. Pete Conrad would command the mission with rookie Alan Bean and command module pilot Dick Gordon. Their destination, the Ocean of Storms, just near the landing site of Surveyor 3, the unmanned craft that had touched down two years earlier. Six, five, four, Three, two, one, zero. All engines running, commit liftoff. We have liftoff, 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The driving rain was not seen as a problem. Although high winds could delay a launch, the Saturn V was an all-weather vehicle and the wet conditions were not a factor. Pressure clear the tower. I got a pitch and a roll program and this thing is really going. Roger, Pete. Soon after liftoff, lightning struck Apollo 12 and ran down the ionized exhaust trail to the launch tower. All instrumentation in the command module went haywire and telemetry readouts on the ground were showing garbage. Apollo 12, Houston, try FCE to auxiliary, over. For a short while, nobody in the craft or on the ground knew what had gone wrong. FCE to auxiliary. Finally, the crew was asked to flip an obscure reset switch. Only Alan Bean knew where it was. It restored all instrumentation and the mission could continue. Apollo 12, Houston, go for staging. Got a good S2, gang. Roger, we copy, Pete. You're looking good. This had happened at a critical period of powered flight, and mission control had come very close to calling an abort. Your thrust is looking good, Pete. The single Earth orbit was spent checking all systems before Apollo 12 was given the all clear to go to the moon. Right, Pete, your uh, fuel cells look good down here. After the huge television audiences for the Apollo 11 lunar mission, NASA had equipped Apollo 12 with a color camera so that audiences around the world could see higher quality pictures from the surface of the moon. the second landing on the moon benefited greatly from design changes derived from the Apollo 11 experience. Baffles inside the lunar module's fuel tanks prevented unwanted sloshing that had confused the flight computer. Today, 81, 32, 
The landing went exactly as planned, with the astronauts recognizing all the landmarks in the vicinity of the Surveyor 3 probe. He's got it made. Come on in there. 24 feet. Contact light. Roger, copy contact. TV starting to... But as Pete Conrad climbed toward the lunar surface in the United States, it was 6 a.m. on Tuesday morning, and very few people were watching the live television pictures. I bet you when I get down to the bottom of the ladder, I can see the surveyor. Viewer ratings were important for NASA. They knew keeping the American taxpayer on side was an important part of convincing politicians that the space agency's generous funding should be maintained. As Alan Bean joined Conrad on the lunar surface, he grabbed the TV camera to relocate it and inadvertently pointed it at the sun. They were the last live Apollo 12 TV pictures from the moon. The pinpoint landing, the much longer stay on the moon and the larger volume of return samples all made Apollo 12 a technical success. But NASA had wanted to keep the American public engaged with the space program and the only pictures anyone saw were short film grabs. Americans were losing interest in space. After the return of Apollo 12, there were still eight more Saturn V launch vehicles in production, enough to stretch as far as Apollo 20. But in January 1970, Apollo 20 was cancelled, and soon the planned Apollo 18 and 19 missions were also scrapped. As NASA was preparing to reap the benefits of space engineering and lunar research, the program was being curtailed. Things would change slightly for Apollo 13. NASA rescheduled the mission's lunar activity to coincide with prime viewing time across the United States. This would cost TV networks money, and they were not happy. Commander Jim Lovell had flown around the moon as command module pilot on Apollo 8. This would be his fourth space flight. His colleagues were both first-time astronauts. The lunar module pilot was Fred Hayes, but the third member of the team had come from the backup crew just three days before launch. Command module pilot Jack Swigert replaced the original crew member, Ken Mattingly, who had been exposed to German measles. Mattingly watched the launch from Mission Control in Houston. Nine, eight, ignition sequence has started. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. Its objective on the moon was the Fra Moro Highlands, named after the adjacent Fra Moro crater. During powered flight, a second stage engine cut out early. The remaining units burned for slightly longer to compensate, but this was no major problem. Okay, uh, Joe, I'm, I'm pointing over toward uh, Jack and it's... Uh, Translunar injection happened smoothly, and the crew soon pulled out their colour TV camera to entertain the people back on Earth. But apart from the people in mission control, no one was watching. The TV networks failed to broadcast the transmission sent from Apollo 13. We've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. Soon after they had ceased their transmission, with the spacecraft three quarters of the way to the moon, an explosion took out the command module's main power supply. Can say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Nobody understood what had happened, but it soon became obvious that Apollo 13 would not land on the moon. Stand by, 13. We're looking at it. Jack, uh... With the command module effectively dead, 
the lunar lander now became the astronaut's sole source of power. Its descent engine would be used for all course corrections. The spacecraft continued out and around the moon on a free return trajectory. Now that's an Atlantic landing site. A landing in the South Atlantic would get them back quickest, but there were no recovery ships in that area. Before Apollo 13 disappeared behind the moon, ground staff began recalculating the burn that would return the craft to the Pacific Ocean. While there was enough food and oxygen to last till the return to Earth, water and power would be critical. Before long, temperatures in the craft had dropped to near freezing. With strictly rationed water, Fred Hayes got a urinary tract infection. The plan was to restore power to the command module using the re-entry batteries just before they hit the Earth's atmosphere. This had never been done before, so a team of experts, including Ken Mattingly, began experimenting with different procedures in a simulator. NASA's space program was back in the headlines, but not for the reasons they wanted. Simulations of the power-up sequence were complicated because condensation, caused by the low temperatures in the command module, threatened to short out the electrical system. But finally, a procedure was radioed to the crew. The rescue showed NASA at its best, creatively solving difficult problems as they arose and returning the three astronauts safely. Apollo 13 would become known as a successful failure. Alan Shepard was NASA's first man in space. Though his Mercury capsule, Freedom 7, had only flown for 15 minutes, he was destined to become an important part of America's space program. In 1964, he was diagnosed with Meniere's disease and suspended from all flight activities. He spent the Gemini program as chief of the astronaut office. After corrective surgery, he was restored to flight duty and eventually was made commander of Apollo 14. His command module pilot was Stuart Rusa. And the lunar module pilot was Ed Mitchell. Apollo 14's objective was Fra Moro, the same area in the lunar highlands that had been targeted by the aborted Apollo 13. It would be the last of the H-type missions that carried no vehicle. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Launch commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff for Apollo 14. Three minutes past the hour. Finally, after almost 10 years, Alan Shepard was back in space. Not long after Apollo 14 reached orbit, his space flight time had doubled. Like all previous Apollo missions, it would be more complex than the one that preceded it. And like all Apollo missions, there would be problems. Docking with the lunar module should have been routine, but on this occasion, the mechanism would not lock. After five attempts, there was still no success. Okay, Houston, uh, we did it twice. On the sixth attempt, Stu Russo made a more aggressive use of his thrusters and the two craft locked together. We got some, Houston. I believe I got a hard dock, Houston. Okay, we seem real steady. I'm gonna In lunar over. orbit, after the lunar module Antares had separated from the mothership Kitty Hawk, the landing computer began flashing an alarm. The abort switch had an intermittent short that would trigger an automatic abort sequence if it happened during the powered stage of Antares' descent to the surface. At Mission Control, though they couldn't fix the switch, they decided to reprogram the computer so it would ignore the spurious alert. They had two hours to work out the new code 
it fell to MIT programmer Don Isles, who came up with a workaround. The new sequence was tested in a simulator, and then the 61 keystrokes required were read up to the astronauts. The landing proceeded with pinpoint accuracy. Three feet per second, look at three. 20 feet. 10. Three feet per second, contact now. Two, stop. Three, four. Okay, we made it to landing. The lunar module had landed on a seven degree incline that made moving in the cabin difficult. They were about one kilometre from the rim of Cone Crater, where they were scheduled to collect samples during their second moonwalk. As with every successful Apollo moon landing mission, the astronauts unfurled the American flag. Before Apollo 11, it had been proposed that the United Nations flag be planted. But Congress had passed a law stating that no flag other than the stars and stripes could be deployed. During previous lunar missions, astronauts had spoken about how difficult it was to judge distances and to recognise landmarks. Shepard and Mitchell were tiring during their climb toward the rim of Cone Crater. Doctors at Mission Control monitoring their heart rates became concerned. They were ordered to return without realising they were only 20 metres from their objective. But NASA was about to eliminate this problem. Apollo astronauts were training with a new piece of hardware. All remaining missions would be able to travel 10 times further from the lunar module using the new lunar rover. Geology was the main feature of the remaining Apollo missions. Preliminary analysis was showing that the moon had once been molten with rocks containing no trace of water. Dave Scott would command Apollo 15. Jim Irwin was the lunar module pilot. This would be his first space flight. Al Warden was the command module pilot. Apollo 15 was also his first space flight. Refinements in the design of the Saturn V launch vehicle and improvements in the targeting and trajectory parameters meant that a heavier version of the lunar module could now reach the moon, carrying heavier loads. The new expanded missions were called J missions. Not only could they take more to the moon, they could bring a greater mass of lunar rock back to the Earth. Their target on the lunar surface was Hadley Rill, a peculiar winding groove, probably formed by ancient volcanic activity. The landing site was in the lunar northern hemisphere near the Apennine Mountains. Separation of the lunar module Falcon from the command module was delayed by a hatch problem, but this was soon solved. Landing techniques were now so refined that Scott was easily able to compensate for an early six kilometre aberration and set Falcon down for another pinpoint landing. The quality of television pictures from the moon had continued to improve as audiences across the United States dwindled. The big difference was the rover. Not only would it allow the astronauts to travel further and to carry more samples, but without exerting themselves, Scott and Irwin used less oxygen and could stay longer on the surface. Dave Scott had taken his geology training very seriously and on the crew's second traverse in the lunar rover, this training paid off. They discovered a white rock at the bottom of the Hadley Rill, which was thought to be part of the lunar bedrock. It became known as the Genesis Rock, and it was more than four billion years old. After almost three days on the moon, Scott and Irwin prepared the Falcon for return to lunar orbit. 
There had only been a few minor glitches during the earlier parts of the mission, and rendezvous, docking and the crews back to Earth continued to remain problem-free. During the final descent, the remaining highly corrosive fuel from the capsule's thrusters was dumped, but this time it caused the collapse of one of the craft's three parachutes. Further damage would have been catastrophic. As 1972 commenced, there were only two remaining Apollo missions. Though the lunar expeditions were increasing in duration and complexity, the American people had lost interest, and so had the political administration. Life-threatening difficulties occurred on every flight, but NASA had been so good at overcoming problems that the drama of lunar exploration was easily pushed off the front pages by war and political scandal. When the last ever mission to the moon blasted off at night during prime time, TV networks were annoyed that launch delays messed up their viewing schedule. Astronaut Gene Cernan would be the last man to walk on the moon and with the return of Apollo 17 to the Earth, lunar exploration stopped. There are no plans to return to the moon. During the 1960s, while NASA was striving to reach the moon, a feasibility study was carried out into a space plane that could be reused. Politicians were wincing at the costs involved in giant boosters that could only be used once. A craft that could take off like a rocket and return to the ground landing like a plane was touted as an economical alternative to disposable rockets. Concepts for a space plane had been around since the 1950s, but most of these had been little more than drawings backed up by a modest set of calculations. In the early months of 1972, a formal agreement was signed and NASA began work on a reusable space launch system that became known as the Space Shuttle. A fleet of four shuttles was planned and they would all be named after famous ships. However, an extra shuttle to be used as a test craft was completed first. It was to be named the Constitution after the famous US naval frigate. But fans of the TV show Star Trek petitioned the government to call it the Enterprise after the fictitious spaceship. As it rolled out from the plant in Palmdale, California, Star Trek fans were there in force. Fortunately, there had been several real ships named the Enterprise, so the administration relented and the new name stuck. Compared to the space capsules in which astronauts had previously returned to Earth, the new machine was huge and testing presented huge problems. NASA modified two 747s to carry the Enterprise to varying altitudes for a series of approach and landing tests. With no engines, it had to glide to a landing, but gliders are light with long wings, and the shuttle was heavy with only stubby wings. It would hit the runway at incredibly high speed. The Enterprise made five non-captive flights, spending a total of just 19 minutes in the air. When Columbia, the first space-worthy shuttle, left the factory, big claims were being made for the new system. It would drastically reduce launch costs and there would be a new mission every week. But there were critics that felt this was far too optimistic. Veteran astronaut John Young would be commander on the first shuttle mission. His pilot was rookie astronaut Bob Crippen, 
This was the first time a completely new launch system had been tested with a crew on board. Young was instrumental in convincing NASA that Columbia's first flight should not be a test of the very risky abort manoeuvre that required the shuttle to flip and to return to the Kennedy landing strip. Columbia blasted off on its maiden voyage in April 1981. It had been almost six years since an American had flown in space. Columbia, Houston, uh, you guys did so good, we're going to let you stay up there for a couple of days. You're going for on orbit. Columbia's first flight and the subsequent three missions were all designed to test the orbiter in space. Modifications will be carried out based on what was learned during these flights. The crew reported that insulating tiles on an engine pod had dislodged. The craft was covered in thermal tiles to protect it during the heat of re-entry. Problems with tiles would be an ongoing issue. Columbia returned to a safe landing and, though this first shuttle mission was a success, the orbiter had extensive tile damage and one of the undercarriage doors had buckled. Shock waves at launch were responsible for some of the damage and the pad would be modified, but clearly the tiles were a vulnerable part of the design and preparing the orbiter for reuse would take longer than expected. A new method for attaching the tiles was introduced and engineers were confident other difficulties could be overcome. It took 103 days for NASA to prepare the spacecraft for its second flight. This would be the last flight with the large external fuel tank painted white, saving 272 kilograms. This time the commander was Joe Engel, with Dick Trugley as his pilot. The four shuttle test flights all had two-man crews. Vital components in the new space transportation system were the two solid rocket boosters. The shuttle program marked the first use of solid fuel rockets for human spaceflight. Unlike the liquid fueled main engines, these boosters could be stored with a full propellant load. But once they were alight, they could not be controlled. They burned until their fuel was exhausted. They were then jettisoned. And, just like the shuttle, these boosters were designed for reuse. Waiting off the coast of Florida, recovery ships tracked their path back to the ocean. They fell from a height of 67 kilometres, with parachutes deploying at 4 kilometres. The recovery team collected the parachutes, pumped out the water and towed them back to NASA for refurbishment. After Columbia's second flight, NASA discovered an O-ring designed to seal the booster's individual sections was partially burned through. Extensive testing of the solid fuel booster with intentionally damaged O-rings did not lead to failure and NASA concluded that the safety factor for this component was large enough. 
The remaining two launches in the shuttle test program saw the space transportation system take on a familiar look, with a large external tank remaining unpainted. Although the system was continually improved, this was the last change to its appearance. These test flights verified the shuttle's ability to cope with on-orbit thermal stress and allowed the crew to gain experience with the robot arm. But there was also a secret military aspect to one of these missions that sat awkwardly with the civilian space agency. Modifications to NASA's original design had been made to accommodate military payloads. After Columbia's successful return from its fourth mission on July the 4th, 1982, the spacecraft was declared operational. This meant it could start earning its keep, and NASA had big plans for its new launch system. But some were arguing that things were happening too fast. New aircraft had to accumulate thousands of safe flights before earning operational status. Over the next three years, Challenger, Discovery and Atlantis entered service, with the new shuttle fleet's primary objective being the deployment of commercial satellites. However, launches were nowhere near approaching the one per week figure claimed during the shuttle's design phase. An orbiter could carry three standard-sized communication satellites. The shuttle fleet began a series of commercial satellite deployments. And when faulty boosters left some expensive satellites in low Earth orbit, new satellite rescue missions were scheduled and a completely new capability became available. The Solarmax satellite, launched in 1980, had lost its attitude control. This left it unable to continue its study of solar flares. But astronauts had been training for a unique repair mission. Nothing like it had been attempted, but NASA was keen to develop the new techniques that the shuttle system was making possible. A completely new device that allowed astronauts to fly freely had been built. NASA had plans for a space station that would require complex construction techniques, and the manned manoeuvring unit was seen as an important new tool for astronauts to master. The repair of Solomax was its first proper task. However, capture of Solomax did not go smoothly, with mission specialist George Nelson inadvertently imparting unwanted tumbling to the satellite. The spin was stabilised by ground controllers and the next day, using the robot arm, Solomax was grabbed and brought into the payload bay. Several instruments had failed and it took two mission specialists two separate spacewalks to complete the intricate repair. The team was discovering that an astronaut mounted on the end of the robotic arm could move with great precision. Though the astronauts who flew it said the MMU responded well to manual control, more practice was needed before it could equal the accuracy of the robotic arm. The repair mission had been so successful that new Earth orbiting satellites would now be redesigned for ease of maintenance. Though the new space transportation system was taking a long time to refurbish between flights, NASA was scheduling future missions at a greater frequency. The space agency was pioneering new procedures and the shuttle's future looked bright. 
1984, there were five shuttle missions. In 1985, with Atlantis completing the shuttle fleet, this increased to nine flights. The overwhelming majority of shuttle flights at this time involved the deployment of satellites, but there were some missions, like the Space Lab, that were dedicated to science, specifically the study of weightlessness on the human body. This saw NASA entering into a partnership with the European Space Agency. Space Lab was carried within the shuttle's payload bay, but NASA was aware that the Soviet space program was planning the launch of an orbiting space station. The construction of a space station had been a prime design consideration with the shuttle, and NASA had begun planning its own space station, but money for this project was not materialising. In January 1986, a crew of seven was preparing for the launch of Challenger. Although Cape Canaveral in Florida has a generally warm climate, conditions leading up to the launch had been frigid. Launch facilities had frozen during the night, but NASA was keen to proceed, and though some voices were urging caution, they were overruled. The crew was to deploy a data and relay tracking satellite. but one of the mission's specialists was schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe. We have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. NASA saw this as an opportunity to rekindle enthusiasm for the space program and to illustrate how safe and routine space flight had become. Control program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Krista McAuliffe's parents were at the Kennedy Space Center to watch the launch. As Challenger climbed yeah, toward orbit, a rubber O-ring designed to provide a seal Normal between the lower segments uh, of the solid fuel booster began leaking flame. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. Seventy-three seconds after launch, the inevitable happened. The solid fuel boosters flew on aimlessly, and the disaster continued to unfold live on television. Obviously a major malfunction. A comprehensive inquiry determined that the extreme cold had caused an O-ring to fail. It led to a redesign of the boosters. The inquiry also determined that NASA management had a tendency to exaggerate reliability to the point of fantasy. Before the next shuttle could fly, every aspect of the space transportation system was scrutinised. New safety procedures were instituted as well. It was 33 months before Discovery was rolled to the launch pad in September 1988. From this point, the shuttle's range of duties had changed. The crew had a new safety regimen and their flight suits had been modified. And significantly, there would be no more commercial satellite deployments. On the Return to Space mission, Discovery's major task was the launch of NASA's own tracking and data relay satellite a replacement for the one lost in the Challenger disaster. Work on a replacement shuttle, Endeavour, was started, but even with a shuttle fleet back to full strength, the frequency of missions would never be as great as before the Challenger disaster. When shuttle flights resumed in 1988, its newly restricted duties blew a hole in NASA's business plan. The space agency still had ambitious scientific objectives, but fees from commercial satellite deployments would no longer flow. Major projects like the orbiting space telescope and what was now known as Space Station Freedom would have to be funded by the government. 
one minute, 30 seconds into the flight, all three auxiliary power units that provide hydraulic power to the orbiter. While the shuttle was grounded, the Soviet Union had started assembling Mir, a space station that would serve as an orbiting laboratory. To NASA, this was good news. Cold War antipathy that had driven the race to the moon still existed. And Congress, not wanting communists to be ahead in anything, began allocating funds for design concepts for space station freedom. Computer-generated vision of space station freedom was produced, but not much else. The unthinkable happened. The Soviet Union collapsed and, with the Cold War at an end, US politicians stopped funding space station freedom. In 1989, Atlantis deployed the Magellan probe, which left Earth and successfully went into orbit around Venus. It was the first interplanetary probe to be launched from a space shuttle. Because Venus is shrouded in heavy cloud, its surface remained a mystery. Magellan used radar to map the planet, revealing unique surface features. Magellan had marked NASA's return to big science, and the shuttle had been an important part in the process. But a new project that would be impossible without the space shuttle was in train, and astronomers were very excited. Work on an optical telescope that would orbit above the distorting effect of the Earth's atmosphere had started in 1979, but delays in its construction had led to delays in its launch date. It became known as the Hubble Space Telescope, and just one of its unique design features was the hinged protecting panels that had door handles. It was designed to be maintained in space, and only a space shuttle could do that. April 1990, and the astronomy world held its breath. Confirmed. Finally, the Heavy most ambitious, off. most expensive telescope ever built was on its way to space, and the scientific breakthroughs from such a clear view of the cosmos were expected to be huge. Discovery had a crew of five, including pilot Charles Bolden, who went on to become the administrator of NASA. Discovery climbed to its highest orbit to date, 612 kilometres. The higher orbit would ensure Hubble's longevity. Apart from a small problem with its solar panels, the deployment of the telescope went smoothly. NASA and its European partners were hoping it would remain in service for at least 15 years. The first pictures from Hubble were blurred and ground staff started adjustments to fine-tune the instrument but in weeks it was apparent that there was a flaw in the primary mirror. Hubble became a laughing stock, the most expensive piece of space junk ever. Soon plans for an elaborate mission to fix Hubble were underway and the space shuttle was an essential part of a mission designed to turn a disaster into a triumph. But nobody was really sure if it would work or even if it was possible. Around the time that the orbiter Discovery had returned from its mission to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope, it was becoming apparent that while the mission had been a success, the telescope was a failure. A manufacturing error had been made and its images were blurred. Almost immediately, astronomers and engineers began formulating a repair mission. In principle, an optical correction could be made and fitted to the telescope, but nobody was sure if this was a practical idea. At this time, work on a new shuttle to replace the lost Challenger was nearing completion. Its first mission would also be a repair operation. In 1990, the communications satellite Intelsat 6 had been left stranded in low Earth orbit. Endeavour's crew would capture the satellite and attach a new booster to lift it 
to a geosynchronous orbit. They had been practicing in NASA's weightless training facility for 12 months before the mission. New equipment had been built for the specialist operation. Endeavour's first flight started in May 1992. The orbiter quickly caught up with the wayward Intelsat and the mission specialists began the operation they had spent so long rehearsing. The plan called for astronaut Pierre Thuort standing at the end of the robot arm to snag the $180 million satellite with a capture bar. But the slow rotation of the satellite made the task impossible and as Thuot continued to grapple with it, he induced more complex motion along all three axes of the four-ton satellite. The attempt was abandoned and the orbiter backed off to a safe distance. After controllers on the ground had brought some degree of stability to the satellite, three astronauts entered the airlock and Commander Dan Brandenstein brought Endeavour close in to the Intelsat and skillfully mimicked its remaining rotation. Then, in a spacewalk lasting more than eight hours, the astronauts managed to grab the satellite with their gloved hands. This exercise had not been rehearsed and had been planned just hours before. The versatility of the shuttle and the ability it afforded its crew to rapidly adapt to real conditions saved the expensive satellite and added to the space transportation system's reputation for complex on-orbit tasks. After attaching a new booster and relaunching it, Intelsat performed for more than 20 years. But this first mission for Endeavour was still not over a construction exercise designed to learn about building techniques in weightlessness was scheduled. NASA was keen to advance its space station concept. The main lesson from this exercise was that astronauts working with their feet securely anchored could carry out tasks in roughly the same time as they could in the ground-based simulator. But without a fixed anchor point, free floating astronauts use most of the time in bodily orientation and work times increased. This had been one of the Space Shuttle's most productive missions so far. If crews working from the shuttle could capture and relaunch Intelsat 6, then it might just be possible to repair the dysfunctional Hubble Space Telescope. Soon, technicians at the Goddard Space Flight Center began working on an optical fix for Hubble. They also designed a suite of specialist tools needed for repair of the space telescope. Engineers had to earn dive qualifications so they could work with mission specialists in the giant pool at the Johnson Space Center. Here, the repair procedures were devised, tested and then rehearsed. The four astronauts selected for the repair mission spent 11 months training in the underwater facility in Houston. In the pre-dawn hours of December the 2nd, 1993, Endeavour lifted off. It took the orbiter several days to catch up to Hubble and the first thing the crew noticed was the buckle in one of the solar panels. Both panels were due for replacement as they had induced unwanted vibration. Over the South Pacific, pilot Dick Covey manoeuvred Endeavour to within nine metres of the telescope. Swiss astronaut Claude Nicolier from the European Space Agency captured the telescope with the robot arm and eased it into the payload bay. There were five spacewalks scheduled to undertake the array of tasks needed to bring Hubble up to operational specifications. 
Story Musgrave and Jeff Hoffman began by replacing the two gyroscopic remote sensing units that enabled the telescope to point accurately. There were problems closing the compartment doors, but by working together, the astronauts managed to get them back in place. The next day, Catherine Thornton and Tom Akers prepared to replace the solar arrays. One would be brought back to Earth for examination, but the damaged panel was discarded above Eastern Africa. The shuttle gently moved away to prevent any collisions. When the new units were connected, the corrective optics package was installed. During the next three days, a range of different tasks were carried out not only to bring the telescope up to its intended specifications, but to give it new capabilities. After each modification, the Space Telescope Operations Centre was able to verify the changes. NASA had completed one of the most challenging and complex missions ever attempted. The Hubble Space Telescope began delivering some of the most detailed visible light images ever seen. Its observations revolutionised our understanding of the universe. In the late 1980s, NASA had a problem. Confidence in the shuttle system had been shaken by the Challenger disaster. The space transportation system had been built as a stepping stone to something bigger, but NASA's plans for a space station had been starved of funds, and the shuttle's reason for existence remained unrealized. But in 1993, post-Soviet Russia and the United States signed an agreement on space cooperation. There had been a link-up between Apollo and Soyuz capsules in 1975, with the two craft coming together for 44 hours. But this had been largely symbolic. Now, post-Cold War Russia and the United States realised that they each had something that the other needed. Russia had Mir, a space station commenced in the Soviet era. But the country was strapped for funds. The US knew the Russians had expertise in orbiting outposts and they wanted to learn from their experience. America had money, but not enough for their own space station. The shuttle Mir program would serve as a bridge to something larger. In February 1995, Discovery rendezvoused but did not dock with Mir. It was the first shuttle to carry a female pilot, Eileen Collins. Over a four-year period, space shuttles made 11 flights to Mir and American astronauts spent seven residencies on board the Russian space station. Shuttles also conducted crew exchanges and delivered supplies and equipment. American astronauts began riding to orbit on Soyuz spacecraft, something that continues to this day. US astronaut Shannon Lucid spent 179 days on Mir, giving her the American record for longest duration single space flight. In the shuttle Mir program, Russia and America learned about long-term space flight and the building of orbital structures. They also learned about cooperation. But mistakes were made. In 1997, during Expedition 27, fire broke out when an oxygen generator overheated. And later, during the same expedition, a supply ship crashed into the space station while attempting to dock. Damage was considerable. Parts of Mir were now 11 years old, and with the knowledge gained during its operation, designers were certain they could build something better, particularly if they could take advantage of the shuttle's unique abilities. Plans for space station freedom had morphed into a multinational collaboration on a replacement for Mir that would be known as the International Space Station.
A memorandum of understanding between NASA and Rosavia Cosmos saw the International Space Station as a laboratory, observatory and factory in low Earth orbit. In November 1998, a proton rocket carrying the first piece of the International Space Station blasted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Known as Zarya, it was soon visited by the shuttle Endeavour that attached a second piece called the Unity Node. It was the first assembly mission. During the subsequent construction phase, most of the Russian components would dock automatically, while the American and European pieces were put in place by the shuttle's robotic arm. Shuttle crew specialists became on-orbit construction engineers, and these crews were now drawn from an international pool, with Russian cosmonauts riding to space alongside their European and American colleagues. Over a two-year period, the International Space Station began taking shape. In November 2000, a crew of two Russians and one American rode to orbit aboard a Russian Soyuz. Though the space station was only partially complete, the crew of three became the first people to take up residence on the ISS. Shuttles and Soyuz capsules visited regularly to add more pieces to the orbiting laboratory and to ferry in new supplies. A different type of astronaut was evolving. People were learning to live in space and not just make quick visits. At this time, not all shuttle flights were to the International Space Station. In January 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia was being prepared for a science mission. The crew of seven would carry out a range of experiments for both NASA and the European Space Agency. It was the style of research that would ultimately be done on the ISS. Columbia lifted off for a 16-day mission but there were no spacewalks or other dangerous aspects scheduled, just hardcore science. For four of the crew, it was their first trip to space. And while they were enjoying weightlessness, engineers on the ground were reviewing tapes of the launch. A chunk of insulating foam had dislodged from the external tank and had hit the orbiter's left wing. There was nothing anyone could do, so the mission proceeded normally, while ground engineers hoped for the best. During the return to Earth, Columbia disappeared from tracking radar. At the same time in the skies above Texas, an explosion was heard, and debris began raining down. Damage to the wing had been catastrophic, and Columbia had broken up. Our nation shares in your sorrow and in your pride. And today we remember not only one moment of tragedy, but seven lives of great purpose and achievement. Before the morning had finished, the search for debris from Columbia had started. Though engineers had a reasonable idea of the cause of the disaster, they had to piece together every fragment of wreckage to fully understand the loss of Columbia. The shuttle would resume flying, but NASA experts made a recommendation about its future. It was announced by the president at NASA headquarters. Our first goal is to complete the International Space Station by 2010. We will finish what we have started. We will meet our obligations to our 15 international partners on this project. In 2010, the Space Shuttle 
after nearly 30 years of duty, will be retired from service. In July 2005, after a hiatus of two and a half years, Discovery was being prepared for its return to space. During the break, redesign work had focused on the foam insulation covering the external tank. New safety procedures had been established. Flights would only go to the International Space Station where astronauts could wait if it was suspected that a shuttle had sustained damage. And every stage of a shuttle's flight would be closely monitored. In 1988, Discovery had also flown the return to space mission after the loss of Challenger. Astronaut Eileen Collins would command the crew of eight. The mission would test on-orbit repair techniques as well as resupplying the International Space Station. Tension in the firing room was palpable. Though each shuttle had been designed for 100 missions, the Columbia Inquiry called the shuttle an aging spacecraft, with the odds of losing another orbiter and crew increasing with each flight. Upon arrival at the International Space Station, Discovery did a slow flip to allow the crew on the space station to inspect the craft for any damage to the thermal tiles. At launch, cameras had again picked up insulation foam breaking free from the external tank. This was not supposed to happen anymore, and although there had been no perceived impact, the new protocol called for all shuttles to perform this inspection manoeuvre. The craft also carried an extension to its robotic arm that allowed a camera to inspect all areas of the thermal protection system. work on completion of the space station was stepped up. Previously planned scientific missions and a final servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope were all cancelled as being too high risk. With every mission now featuring long duration spacewalks, not just from the shuttle, but also by astronauts living on the International Space Station, training in NASA's neutral buoyancy laboratory became intense and NASA began referring to the period as the Wall of EVA. Mission specialists would spend years training for the specific tasks that they would have only one opportunity to execute. After Discovery's return to space mission, shuttle flights kept adding to the space station. But almost immediately, dissatisfaction began surfacing within America's scientific community. The Hubble Space Telescope was badly in need of fine guidance sensors, new gyroscopes and batteries, and astronomers were putting pressure on their politicians to allow one last servicing mission to Hubble. In October 2006, NASA's new administrator, Michael Griffin, fudged the safety issue and announced a final repair mission to the Space Telescope. Three months later, the advanced survey camera, Hubble's most heavily used instrument, went dead. Work on the International Space Station began expanding the role of the shuttle. As well as performing most of the on-orbit construction, the shuttle was now ferrying Russian cosmonauts and European astronauts to and from the ISS while Americans were riding to orbit on Russian Soyuz craft. The ISS began taking shape, with techniques pioneered on one mission becoming standard on the next. <laughs> 
but a new mock-up had been installed in NASA's neutral buoyancy facility. Hubble repair became the focus of one crew destined to be the last to visit the space telescope. In May 2009, Atlantis headed for Hubble. After five spacewalks, the telescope had been completely refurbished and astronomy's most valuable instrument was back in business. In July 2011, Atlantis was the last shuttle to fly. It delivered supplies and spares to the ISS. After 12 days, Atlantis returned. It and the rest of the shuttle fleet are now museum pieces. <laughs>